Hey guys and welcome to the fish room. I'm Rachel O'Leary and it's time for a Tuesday tip. Now I thought today we would talk about some of the biggest myths I see floating around the internet which I think are especially relevant to new hobbyists. There's quite a lot of regurgitation and repeating of information that isn't always necessarily true. So today we're going to talk about that. The first myth I want to talk about is that you should always add a catfish or a pleco to your aquarium in order to clean up the waste and eat uneaten food. While it is true that Coriodorus and a lot of plecos and a lot of those catfishes will eat uneaten food, it's also true that they need a very specific targeted diet in order to thrive. Most catfish species are extremely long-lived and a lot of them are very breedable. However, if you don't feed them properly and feed them adequately, their lifespan is greatly shortened. Many of the catfish species can live 20 years or more. So again, while it's true, a lot of them will eat some of the algae and will eat the uneaten food, they also need a very specific diet geared just towards them in adequate quantities in order to do really well. In fact, a lot of the catfish that are commonly sold for algae control or cleanup, like the common pleco, are mostly unsuitable to any aquarium that you can buy in your local fish store. There's really no replacement for water changes, gravel vacs, and algae scraping. That's just the bottom line. Some species will help a little bit, but the reality is by eating that waste and eating that algae, they produce more. So at the end of the day, while they are active, engaging, fun, amazing species to add to your aquarium, they certainly won't do your maintenance for you. The next myth I want to talk about is snails. Now we all know that snails are near and dear to my heart. For this segment, we're going to be talking about the common snails. This is your bladder snails, your pond snails, your ram's horn snails, and your Malaysian trumpets. Now for years and years and years, the myth has been perpetuated that if these get into your tank, they are going to explode in population, eat your plants, and destroy your aquarium. The reality is that these little critters can only reproduce if they have a viable food source. This means uneaten food, so you're overfeeding your fish, algae, which means something's out of whack in your aquarium, be it your light, lighting cycle or the nutrient load for your plants, or if you are not gravel backing and there's a buildup of detritus in your aquarium. Another thing that they can feed on is unhealthy plants. So if you are not maintaining your plants properly and they're starting to die, snail's radula can generally only chew through softened leaves. This means they can't physically eat most aquarium plants. I find pest snails to be an exceptional barometer of our maintenance and feeding routines. If they're relatively few in number and you start to see a really visible increase in their populations, you know something's changed. Either you're developing algae, your plants are unhealthy, you're overfeeding, or you've been slacking with those gravel bags. Because as I mentioned, they can only reproduce with a food source. So personally, I like having them in all of my aquariums simply because they are sort of a signifer species, signifying species that show you when something is starting to go amiss. The next myth I want to talk about is small aquariums. Now, I think a lot of pet stores push little tiny desktop aquariums to new hobbyists because they're affordable, they're generally attractive, and it's not a huge investment to a new hobbyist, but the reality is it's really, really difficult to maintain a true nano aquarium, one under 10 gallons, especially if you're new to the hobby. The smaller amount of volume means you're more limited in species that you can stock. It also means that there's less dilution. And when you add fish, you know, these tanks can only process so much waste and they can only provide so much oxygen. When things start to go downhill, it can happen really fast in a small aquarium. I really encourage anyone new to the hobby to get the biggest aquarium that you can comfortably fit in the space where you want to place it. 
I personally think that something like a 20 gallon long is one of the best footprints for a beginner aquarist. You can fit a lot of different kinds of fish, or I should, I should clarify, there are many, many, many kinds of fish that will do well in a 20 long. They give you a versatility of space in order to play around with aquascaping and plants. And they have a good footprint for oxygen exchange, which reduces the stress of your fish overall. Not only that, but the bigger volume really does help with the dilution. Small tanks under 10 gallons can also be really difficult to clean, mainly because the vast majority of the products on the market are geared for a more average size aquarium, and it can be very easy to drain as much water as you need to before you've actually gotten to clean the gravel. So while you guys know I love nano fish and I love small aquariums, I really think that they're not at all suitable for the beginner aquarist. The next myth that I would like to talk about is the myth that fish only grow to the size of their tank. Now there's not many papers out there that actually address that specific issue that where people say that the organs will get stunted and crushed and the fish's body won't grow but the organs continue to grow. So there's no way for me to prove that as fact or fiction. But what I can tell you is if that you put a fish in an aquarium that gets too large for the aquarium, a few things can happen. One is that the filtration often can't process the wastes produced which causes a stress response in the fish. What this means is that instead of the fish um, taking its nutrients and conserving energy to things like growth and reproduction and digestion and all the healthy things that fish do as part of their life in our contrived boxes, instead it goes to more of like a flight response or a stress response or an expulsion of energy in order for them to survive. What does this mean? It means instead of our fish being able to process all the salts and ions and things in the water in order to retain sort of their osmoregulation and the homeostasis of fish in water, instead they are basically go into survival mode, which means there's increased blood flow. That increased blood flow goes to their gills, which actually can get bigger in order to process more oxygen but at the same time, it is preventing them from again absorbing all those nutrients from the water column, those ions and those salts that they really need to do well long term. This can lead to premature gill aging, sort of, and eventually premature death for your fish. Now, this may not at all be readily visible to the naked eye. This can go on for months and months and months, and then all of a sudden, a fish dies. No outward symptoms, nothing visible, it just dies. And I think that this is probably the most leading cause of fish deaths in our aquariums. And, and what causes it? Inappropriate stocking, meaning you're mixing fish that really just don't do well together. Even if they're not attacking each other, they just don't complement one another. Uh, keeping too many fish in too little of a volume or keeping too big of a fish in too small of a tank. So there's a few things that we can do. We can choose an aquarium that is appropriate for the life of the fish. Personally, I do grow out large fish in smaller aquariums for a short amount of time, but you always have to have the large aquarium available by the time the fish needs it. For instance, I grew out my big um, bikers in 20 longs. They were an inch fish, a two inch fish, a three inch fish. I grew them out in those until they hit about six inches, at which point I moved them to a 120 gallon tank for grow out until they eventually moved in their 240 gallon aquarium. And honestly, I'm working right now on getting them an even bigger one. It's appropriate for them now, but not for forever. Another thing that we really need to take in cons into consideration is how fish interact with each other. And I know this can be very confusing because, you know, we don't get to go watch fish in their natural habitat. But luckily for us, the internet is at our disposal and there is tons of information out there on where fish come from, what the water's like, what, what other fish are found with them, and how they behave. It's really important to not combine fish 
that just don't complement one another. And I think it's really, really tempting, especially to new hobbyists, to try and get that community aquarium that keeps a little bit of everything you like. But the reality is, it rarely goes well for a very long time. The most successful community aquariums generally are those that are stocked from at least a loose geographical region. And that's because of this stress response that's caused. Now, the stress response can make them unable to digest their food, it can affect their reproduction, it can you know, affect their growth, and as I mentioned, it can lead to premature death. So when you're maintaining an aquarium with your fish, the most important things to do for their longevity are keep your aquarium clean, do a weekly water change, vacuum your gravel, trim your plants, make sure you're removing dying plants, Make sure that there's adequate oxygenation, like you have decent filtration. And really try your best to be very thoughtful in choosing the inhabitants that you combine together. The biggest issue, I think, with this, this stress response is that it really compromises the fish's immunity. As I mentioned, you know, that their energy is going towards survival instead of thriving. And what this can do is it can also lead to their slime coat being compromised. And the slime coat is that sort of slippery feeling on the outside of the fish. That's part of their normal physicality. When they're really, really stressed, their energy is not going to maintaining their slime coat. So it can become interrupted or broken. And this is one of, and this is the time when disease can really strike. Let's be real, pathogens are generally everywhere. When you're really, really healthy, you don't get the cold. But when you're, you know, but when you're tired or run down is when you tend to get sick. It's the same for our fish. If they're overcrowded or with tank mates that they don't get along with, they're stressed out and it makes them more susceptible to illness. This lowered immune system is a real problem, not only for new fish that you're adding to an aquarium, but to the fish that you already have in there. If they're not compatible, everyone's at risk. That's why I really feel that quarantine is extremely important, no matter the source of the fish. It doesn't matter if they've been seemingly healthy for months. If they get stressed out from shipping, from moving tanks, or from being placed in an aquarium that's different from what they're used to, it can make them have this stress response and can make them more likely to become ill. So again, the best course of action is a quarantine for at least several weeks where you're feeding them well, keeping the water clean, letting everyone relax, and really bolstering that immune system so that you can have the best chance of success in your aquarium. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this week's video on debunking some of the common myths out there. If you have any more that you're used to hearing or seeing perpetuated throughout the internet, let me know below and maybe I'll do another one of these videos in the future. As always, thank you guys so much for your continued support. Make sure you hit the notification bell so you don't miss any of my upcoming videos and stop by all my social media as well as my website, MsJinx.com.